Let's pray. Come, Holy Spirit of truth, and lead us into all truth and remind us of the things of Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus, as the living word and bring this word alive to us today. Give us hearts that desire to listen, minds that seek to understand, and lives that seek to live in response to your leading, Lord Jesus. For we pray in the name of Jesus, who is Lord and Savior, in Jesus' name, amen. During seminary courses and through his writing, I keep on learning from the words and wisdom of Harold Percy about discipleship and evangelism, about growing in faith and sharing our faith. In his book, Following Jesus, First Steps on the Way, Harold describes the connection between reaching out and building up in this way. He writes, as followers of Jesus, we need spiritual food and spiritual exercise in order to experience and sustain healthy spiritual growth and become mature Christians. If we only have food, our growth will not be healthy. If we only have exercise, we will not last. Both food and exercise are required for healthy growth. Harold's wise words help me better understand Psalm 34, verse 8, that says this, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in him. For me to stay spiritually healthy, I need to keep on filling up and building up my spiritual strength, to keep feeding on scripture and being nourished in worship together. I have some go-to spiritual practices that keep me from going empty, spiritually speaking. What about you? What are your spiritual practices and experiences, either personal or communal, either on your own or as you gather with other believers, that have helped you taste and see that the Lord is good? How can such spiritual food support us and sustain us in our spiritual exercise? According to the superscription or the framing, those introductory lines in Psalm 34, there is a connection between Psalm 34 and the story in 1 Samuel 21, verses 10 to 15. In this story, David is fleeing for his life. He's being hunted by King Saul. He's living in fear. So he escapes to Gath, but the servants of the king in that area recognize who he is and his reputation as a great warrior. So fearing that he would be reported and returned to King Saul, betrayed if you will, what he does is that David pretends to be insane. You can read the story, it's somewhat comical, as King David, this valiant warrior, looks in all sorts of ways if he's gone out of his mind. And what happens as a result of this is that the king of Gath thinks, this is no mighty warrior. This is no threat to me, no threat to King Saul. Why is he in my court? And so under this dramatic behavior that sort of convinces the king that he's really not much of anything, David is able to escape again to a safer place, a hiding place, a place of refuge. And with this background in mind, Psalm 34 verses 4 to 7 is even more memorable David recounts how the Lord has answered prayers. He's freed him from fears, helped him experience radiant joy as he relied on the Lord's help and saving power from all his troubles. He protected him from great danger. And so this is the background of the opening verses of Psalm 34 that I read. And it's out of this context that we get this powerful content in verse 8. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys who take refuge in him. David, who was literally fleeing for his life, knew that God was his refuge. In case we miss our positioning or the perspective of David, listen again to verses 17 and 18. The Lord hears his people when they call to him for help. He rescues them from all his troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. 
He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. You see, David is not reflecting from a position of superiority, but rather from a place of vulnerability. David is not showing arrogance, but humble dependence on the Lord who lifts him up. Such rich reflections reframe how we view the journey to maturity in Christ. In her classic book, Soul Feast, Marjorie Thompson writes this, God's Spirit is continually challenging, changing, and maturing us. Although we may be able to point to a decisive moment on our spiritual journey, a decisive conversion experience for some, remaining faithful involves a journey of continual conversion. It can never be said in our lifetime that we have arrived. The spiritual life invites a process of transformation in the life of the believer. Christ, she writes, provides realistic hope for a realistic life. He is the wellspring of our thirst, the bread for every hunger of the human heart. And then quoting from Psalm 34, 8, she says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. I put this quotation on the message notes available on the e-blast and in the foyer but also on the next slide that will come up so you can see again the conclusion she draws from this. Once we have tasted living bread and drunk living water, we will be able to lead others who hunger and thirst to our common vital source. Let me read that again for you. Once we have tasted living bread and drunk living water, We will be able to lead others who hunger and thirst to our common vital source. The great Baptist preacher Charles Spurgeon put it this way, evangelism is one beggar telling another beggar where to find food. It's not out of a position of superiority. It's saying, I am hungry. Will you join me in finding food where I'm finding spiritual refreshment? Notice the humble confidence that opens Psalm 34. I will praise the Lord at all times. I will constantly speak his praises. I will boast only in the Lord. Let all who are helpless take heart. Come, let us tell of the Lord's greatness. Let us exalt his name together. According to Psalm 34, if you've ever felt helpless or in over your head, like I have at times, you're qualified to tell others of the greatness of God. Maybe you felt hungry or thirsty, like my life is unraveling, I don't have clarity, I'm confused. Psalm 34 says, you're perfectly positioned to tell about how you're seeking God in the middle of whatever you're facing because you are looking for food from God, living water for the soul. Rather than being self-reliant, we are God-dependent. Sharing the good news or evangelism is admitting we are beggars and that we are sharing with other beggars our own search for food and spiritual refreshment. I put a table on the slide behind me in the message notes to help us notice how we can taste and see that the Lord is good even when we've experienced the ugliness or the hunger of our world, of our lives. This gives us show-and-tell material, if you will. I remember in elementary school, I had one teacher, and her tradition at the end of summer holidays was everybody had to bring something in. What did you do on your summer vacation? Then you would show something and you would tell a story. So what Psalm 34 is saying, taste and see that the Lord is good, and then what do you bring for show-and-tell? What can you show about how God has touched you so that you have something to tell? Tasting the food gives us opportunities for outreach exercise as we share such food, good food, with others. For personal reflection and small group discussion, I invite you to ask these questions. How can such experiences give us something to share as we tell of the Lord's greatness? 
How can sharing such stories within the church prepare us for sharing with those who are spiritually searching or who are currently not yet connected to Christ? It can help us inside the church if within the church and among our small groups, with our prayer partners, our spiritual friends, we share these little vignettes and stories. This is how I was tasting and seeing that God is good this week. So when an opportunity comes for conversation beyond the church, in a sense, we've been practicing. We've been remembering God is good. God is great. I have a glimpse of grace that I want to share. Again, not from a position of superiority, but vulnerability where we are all on this journey together. In his compelling book, Beyond Awkward, I love the title, when talking about Jesus is beyond your comfort zone, Bo Crisetto shares a story as he writes. He says this, My wife and I got into a significant fight one night and needed help from our friends to sort it out and reconcile. I had gotten angry with her and lost my temper. For good reason, she was upset with me. We fully worked it out with our friends, said our apologies, forgave each other, and learned how we can love each other better going forward. As I was praying after the fight, God brought Ben to mind and told me I needed to tell him about my fight with my wife and how I struggle with anger too. I also needed to tell Ben how I work through fights like these with Jesus' help, seeking transformation by submitting my life to God and his leading. He continues the story. As Ben and I were driving to volleyball the next weekend, I told Ben that I had gotten into a bad fight with my wife earlier in the week and lost my temper. I told him I struggle with anger and that I'm asking God to transform me. I told him that as a Christian, when I make mistakes and sin, I confess my sin to God and ask him to forgive me. I also ask God to fill me with more of his love so I can live as I was meant to live. Ben was intrigued, but also quick to tell me that I shouldn't worry about it. After all, everyone makes mistakes, is what Ben said. But I had a different take, he writes. Ben, being a Christian means you believe God is real and present and has relationship with us. It means that I no longer guide my own life. I now follow Jesus and ask him to transform me into the loving person we see he is in Scripture. That is what I want to talk to you about. God can help you with your anger too if you want to give him control of your life. He can change you and transform you. You don't have to stay the same. Ben thanked me and again said we needed to talk more later. He said he wanted to go out for a drink and hash this out. He did want to learn more about God. Bo then comments, sharing our transformational stories, especially those that show how we submit our life to Jesus as Lord, especially allows us to be vulnerable and relate to our friends. When we share our brokenness and allow others to see our emotional junk, they can see how we are letting Jesus change us. It shows them that we are normal human beings, no different than they are. We are not holier than thou, and we too have real problems. It also reveals that Jesus is real and transformation is possible. When we do this, he says, people start to see how they can be changed. It allows them to reflect on how they could be different with Jesus in their life. And I love this line. Listen to what he says. Our job in this experience-based culture is to show people that Jesus works and changes us. Our job in this experience-based culture is to show that Jesus works and changes us. Does this sound familiar to us, Kingsway? Remember our vision. Changing through Jesus in community engaging like Jesus in our world. Let me reflect on some of the dynamics of this story that I just told from Bo. In view of what we heard from Psalm 34, verses 13 to 15, where we read, 
Then keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn away from evil and do good. Search for peace and work to maintain it. The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right. His ears are open to their cries for help. So notice in the story how Bo spoke the truth, even when it showed his own brokenness and vulnerability. He wasn't lying about having his life all together with perfect relationships. Instead, he said, I'm working on it. Notice how Bo was working on turning away from the evil of his unhealthy expressions of anger and learning to do good in healthier patterns of reconciliation. Notice how he was searching for peace and working at it in his family and with his friend. Notice how he was praying for himself, for his family, and for his friend to experience life change through Jesus. Bo understood that he needed the life change just as much as his friend. Notice how this honest sharing of struggle and change on Bo's journey gave an opportunity for Bo then to give a reason for the hope that he had in Jesus. You see, when we notice such deeper dynamics, Peter's logic is clearer in why he quotes from Psalm 34 to describe evangelism or sharing the good news of Jesus. Our reading from 1 Peter 3 highlights the attitudes and actions that frame our hope. Being sympathetic and loving, compassionate and humble, seeking to repay evil with blessing and living out Psalm 34. And when such attitudes and actions are present, 1 Peter 3.15 tells us to be ready to give a reason for the hope that you have. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have, Peter writes. But do this with gentleness and respect. You may be relieved to know that outreach and evangelism, showing and telling the good news of Jesus, does not need to be flashy or pushy. You don't have to be an extrovert. You don't have to be aggressive. You don't have to be annoying and in someone's face. Peter simply coaches us to show attitudes and actions of gentleness and respect, being compassionate and humble, loving and blessing others. Let me suggest King's Way that the taste of the King's Way is an incredible opportunity to show such attitudes and actions as we host our neighborhood guests. Not very many churches have the opportunity that there's a community block party in the neighborhood and they literally have to walk by the church to get down to the action. We have an opportunity to be a host of the guests of our neighbors. We can invite them to taste and see what we are discovering in Jesus as we show and tell the difference Jesus is making in our lives. But even if we get no opportunities to say anything much about the church, our first task, our primary task, is simply to love our neighbors genuinely and deeply with gentleness and respect. Joe Aldrich describes how he met a fascinating, radiant Christian from India. His ministry to international students is leading scores of Hindus and Muslims to Christ. What accounts for his effectiveness in reaching members of those radically different cultural and religious traditions? Each Sunday, he told me, he and his wife host somewhere between 30 and 50 students for dinner. Food and camaraderie break down barriers. There's something about eating a meal with someone that accelerates friendship. So you talk to them about Christ at these meals, I asked? No, he said. It's impossible to talk openly of Jesus Christ. So how, I asked him, are you able to see so many find Christ? I love them, he replied, until they ask me why. Let me repeat that insightful line. I love them until they ask me why. 
Through loving them, he continued, they meet Jesus Christ even though they don't know whom they've met. Once they've sensed the reality of his love through me, they're open to discuss the reason for the love and acceptance they've experienced. Let me suggest that with the taste of the king's way and in other ways, let's learn more together about loving people until they ask why. You see, what happens for genuine outreach is that outreach overflows from our hope in Jesus Christ as we taste and see, as we show and tell. Let's pray together. Lord, even now in this moment of quiet reflection, remind us of something from this past week where you've helped us to taste and see that you are good where we've had a glimpse of grace and we can be thankful for how you're at work. Lord, in this quiet moment, help us to think about a neighbor, a friend, a work colleague, a family member whom we long to show more of your love to. Give us wisdom in the week ahead to have a conversation about maybe our joys in Jesus or maybe it's about our struggles where we seek you, Lord Jesus, to change us and we share our struggles with others. Bring to mind people whom we can pray for and give us the courage and the creativity and the compassion to love people in the King's way, to love our neighbors deeply and genuinely through the taste of the King's way, through the summer camps, through many other opportunities we have and will continue to have. Lord Jesus, lead us. Help us to follow you as you guide us step by step. For we pray all this in the name of Jesus, who is our Lord and Savior, our life leader and forgiver. In Jesus' name, amen.